How you guys doing? We're looking at the Bristol Cup Series race for this weekend. When I look back at what I'm really enjoying, I'm very satisfied with everything, is just starting from scratch. Like, I, I'm not doing anything I used to, literally starting from square one, working our way up, figuring things out. Last week, people did extremely well. I, for one, was like, oh, man, I'm going to be a little cute. I'm going to be overweight on Cindric. I think he's good chalk. I'm going to be overweight on Cindric. Bam. Oh, you know what? Dude, I really like these lineups. You know, I think they're projected well. I'm going to get a little different. Even if he underperforms, I'm going to have non-duplicated lineups. You know what? I haven't heard one person talk about him this entire day. I'm going to have 20% Austin Dillon. Okay? So I'm going to be overweight on Cindric, and I'm going to have 20% Austin Dillon to get different. And then, like, lap seven, you know, just how it goes. But I am very satisfied with the process and how everything worked last weekend between the practice show on Friday. We talked about everything up until or up until the race with who I was playing and stuff like that. So I'm very, very satisfied with how everything went. In terms of Bristol, I went to do the exact same thing. And because, you know, it's Bristol, I very similar to like Atlanta is its own animal. I understand you can pull things from different places, but I really do believe you should categorize Atlanta as its own track. Okay. Bristol, you know, you want to use Dover. Like we're focusing on just Bristol. I want to focus on just Bristol specifically what we see in practice and i mean really like two races in an x-gen car like come on guys like really we're, we're looking at the bristol motor speedway racing association track you know we've only had like seriously we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do this twice so we can show you like really well, you want me to use data i understand some people do well i understand some people do better but like seriously kyle bush like really I'm going to dilute stuff with data points filled from, you know, an old generation of car, an old car and stuff. And I'm, I'm, I mean, Kyle Busch might be either a bad example for this or a good example of this because everything before, you know, really the next gen stuff and last year the of the Gen 6, like he was, he was, he was stellar. He was fighting for wins and stuff. Whereas you look at the last two years, and I mean, I understand that we've had engine failures and crashes. And last year we had, you know, Logano have an issue. We had Blaney. Uh, who just kept putting around, you know, and stuff like 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 we we've had issues, but specifically these these last two races being in the playoffs and these last two races being the only ones in the next gen car, like for me, man, I'm kind of I'm I'm sorry, but like I I don't really want to look at any previous data point in terms of driver, okay? In terms of like oh man, how driver C dude? Well, driver C is averaging an average running position of twelve point one. He's averaging, you know. 27.2 fast laps he's averaging 40 laps led in these races like that's I, I don't want to go through that for me I look at and we can look at this in two ways but like for me I look at what is going on this week based on practice based on kind of just recent form of how everybody's kind of doing like I, I don't care if he was the fastest car at Las Vegas what, what is this guy looking at here in Bristol did he unload off the trailer is he at least competent where yet where you Where's he at in terms of speed? Bristol is an awesome racetrack, even even with these short practice sessions. I understand we're going to have you know, the traction compound sprayed. We're going to have the two different groups and stuff. But even still, you can tell if somebody has a good car or a bad car based on how long they're staying out, based on what they're doing. What is going on over here? Hold on. Oh, sorry. Um, like... <clears throat> the fact that you that these are 15 second laps okay dude man we do four minutes of practice four eight 12 16 we're, we're at 16 laps in four minutes okay like that's a significant amount of time whether it be in the race hey you get the lead you stay out you know or you take two tires you get the lead you lead for four minutes that's already 16 laps that's already potential like eight fast laps you know like time here at bristol is is huge and more so it in my opinion it's not even driver situation i think when we look at the 2022 optimal lineup it left or i don't even know if it was played but the optimal lineup i think left 800 dollars on the table past that we're typically seeing either 200 100 dollars or the full fifty thousand uh in salary used okay so we're not seeing a situation of you know pivots working out or pivots off of this or off of that or whatever you know it's literally you have to jam in as many of the fast lap leaders and the lap lead getters and anybody basically scoring over 40 points other than your putt play. 
on the bottom. And so like when we're looking back at like previous optimal lineups or who's been optimal and stuff, well, a lot of that is very much price dependent. You know, and we're looking at a lot of the RFK stuff. We're seeing that they were mispriced or underpriced, certainly compared to what we are now. And so like, at least for me, I don't want, this is me speaking. Yet again, starting from square one, you know, approaching these short tracks. I haven't liked specifically Bristol. God knows I hate this track for DFS. I'm starting over, man. I don't want to come in with any, um, you know, ideas entering this week or any biases towards each or a certain driver or whatever, like the RFK guys. If they look good in practice and they qualify, I'm going to play them. Okay, but I shouldn't just like them right now entering the week. You know, I, I shouldn't just like people based off where they are in salary. Like, I haven't, I haven't even looked at salaries yet. There's really no reason to. I, I know, for the most part, all my lineups are going to leave 200 to 100 or zero dollars on the table. I am jamming in literally everybody I think is going to lead laps. I know for a fact that, you know, who's going to decide the GPPs? It's most likely whoever starts farther back between Grala, Haley, Burton, and Hemrick. Okay. Between those $400, between those idiots, that's going to be pretty huge. That's going to be pretty significant. Who is going to, that? that's like a point where I'm like, who legit is going to look better from those four guys, okay? High likelihood that Burton qualifies like mid-20s, okay? High likelihood we have Haley and Grala starting in the 30s. Real chance we have Hemrick starting like 26, 27th, okay? So based off of that type of stuff, it makes it really hard and I'm not trying to like predict where these guys are going to qualify, but like really, we, we have to try and figure out what we're doing, like salary wise, in my punt play in a race that is multiple hours long with 500 laps. And we typically see a lot of people go laps down in this event if you start in the back of the field. I'm punting whoever is starting farthest back between the four cheapest guys, okay? There is no reason to worry past that. Once we get to that, then we can chase all the lab leaders and stuff that we want. Um, Going back to this, okay, yet again, I don't want to use, you know, this huge data point because this is going to be like, man, you know, Kyle Busch looking pretty good, you know, like we've we've seen, you know, based on the uh, the other stuff that we kind of looked at last week of where Kyle Busch has fallen in line at, you know, like we understand that Kyle Busch is most likely not going to compete for the win, not going to compete for the top five this week, you know, and so when, when I look at Bristol here and we look at specifically the last two races, this is the only data set in terms of uh, track history that I would want to look at, okay? Yet again, caveats are these are playoff races. These are the only two races in the next-gen car here. These are situations to where people were either trying to, like, do a slam-dunk play or stay in the playoffs or advance to the next round. Excuse me. And there's been a lot of carnage. As you can see, we've only had six people who have had a top five in each of these, and we've only had six people who have had a top 10 in each of these races. Typically, if people are good at a track or if variance isn't that wild, we typically see in two races at a, at a specific race, we'll see more people who are averaging a top 10 and stuff, uh, at least in both of them. Here, like, people have had good races and bad races. And so, like, when we're entering this week, hell, even let me look at the salary here. So, like, Larson's 11.5, Hamlin's 11.2, Bell's 11, Byron's 10.7, I'm telling you right now, yet again, we're putting at the bottom of the salary. Um, we have seen, not just recently, that DraftKings is using you know 5000 as the cheapest, but we have seen in the previous optimal lineups that because we no longer, we're really no longer seeing guys in the 4000s anymore, that you know, somebody at 5000, 51, 52, 54 is perfectly fine for a punt, even if they don't hit value. We're seeing the value plays be optimal at or the punt plays be viable at, you know, 22 points, uh, 24 points, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, like, even a 5X is not even neat. It's literally jamming in whoever leads laps. And for me, because at this point, it's like it's Bristol. Like, bro, I suck at Bristol. So, like, I'm a content consumer this week, okay? And this is the one point that I, at least for me, whenever I explain things and talk about them, especially in live shows and stuff, I at least inform you of why I've come to conclusions or why I like certain drivers or why I don't like certain drivers and stuff like that. I hate it. And especially a Bristol race with this many laps, I hate means on projections. That doesn't help me at all. I'm speaking like I'm speaking as a content consumer here. Okay. If I'm looking at 
Saberson, if I'm looking at other projection sources and I see like seven people projected between 49 points and 45 points, that does nothing to help me out. That does nothing. Do you understand? Like how that doesn't, that doesn't help at all. Okay. I want to figure out who is, who has, you know, like who has the best chance of being in the top five at the end of the race. Okay. That's the main thing we're focusing on. Okay. And why is that so difficult? Because we have pit strategies. We've had, um, not even just pit strategies. Some people staying out depending on when yellows comes out, depending on how close they are to the stages. We've seen guys who have been, who have made optimal lineups, not get the lead until late in the race due to pit strategy, due to where yellows come out and stuff like that. Like Bristol is such a hard, hard track to predict and build for. That's why, you know, Bristol certainly in the fall is used for so many huge tournaments on DraftKings. I think the King of the Speedway used to be decided uh, at Bristol and then Homestead and stuff. But um, like, that's why it's so wide open. Okay. And so when we're building lineups, okay, yet again, we're punting at the bottom. That's just how it is. So we're building lineups with five positions. Okay. Three of those are most likely guys in the nine and 10 K range. If not all three above 10 K when we're looking at where these guys are, bell 11,000 Larson 11, five, Chris Buescher, who has shown up a lot in these races recently, I believe he was like 6K in this uh, in this first year, uh, or in this first year in 2022. Um, yet again, you know, finished fourth last year. Like, okay, yeah, he's $9,800. Like, he needs to lead laps. It's literally if you don't lead laps, your your lineup is dead. It, it like I think that's why Bristol is so frustrating it like i just i don't know man i have such a hate relation this is, i just i just hate bristol from a dfs perspective because if you have five guys in your lineup okay and you miss one of the lap leaders okay well the optimal is gone you're not getting the optimal lineup you can still cash and we get again when you're throwing darts trying to hit whoever leads laps you know if you throw four guys who realistically have a chance of being in first and getting the lead on pit road or whatever happens, like you're, you're, you have a good chance of laying on at least one of them, okay? And you can cash there, especially when it comes down to ownership as well. Like if, you know, yet again, Kyle Busch is showing up as like a fantastic play based on all his, all his, all his other stuff. Well, let's use somebody like Logano. Where Where's Logano fallen in line at? Somebody who's just been like God atrocious, he's got to be down here. It's like Logano, for example, here. This is much more, at least for Bristol. And I understand I'm not mentioning much in terms of, you know, my usual thing. But this is Bristol. I think it's its, it's, its own animal. When we're looking at how horrific he has been starting position-wise, practice-wise, okay? Everything is showing, let's not play Legato. Let's not do it. Whereas um, at Bristol, I'm much more open, especially now where I'm at because I know I've missed on Bristol before I'm much more open to playing ugly plays especially if the ownership is not there on somebody like Logano I think Logano makes a amazing tournament play you know like the fact that he could come in at like anywhere from like 17 to less percent ownership based on how bad he's been based especially if he qualifies like 11th 12th not a lot of place different like that's Bristol is such a interesting thing for DFS, man. Yet again, when we're looking at optimal lineups and stuff, when we look at the optimal lineup, you can play the optimal lineup. It's just jamming in literally every single lap leader you have with whoever you can afford or based on, uh, like, you just play the raw points, guys. Because you're most likely going to have, you know, a score that'll fall anywhere at, at the end of the race, lineup-wise, that'll fall anywhere from, like, 470 to probably, like, 530, Okay. So that typically means we're going to have three guys that are going to be scoring like, you know, anywhere from 120 to 150 points in those lineups. Um, so like if you're fighting optimal or if you're, if you're building for the optimal, like that, that's so hard. You have to hit everything correctly. You got to be prepared for all these stupid yellows and all these like pit road selections. Like how do you predict that? How do you, how do you realistically predict that? All these Sims guys. Okay. You know, I better see a fucking Sim bro win bristol this week okay because <laughs> i swear to god man the the sim boys this is a race where the sims should 
on paper kill, right? Because they can sim who's going to lead laps. And they're going to sim who's going to be up there. Um, I don't know. For me, I've never been able to hit every single lap leader. I've always missed on one. And in terms of building and caching and stuff like that, yet again, when we're looking at a race that will probably have three DFS guys scoring over 100 points, yes, Obmol is going to have all of them. The cash line is most likely going to be two of them, correct? Like, we can do that. If you have, like, the guy who leads the first half of the race, he runs into an issue, falls back, like, seventh or whatever, and somebody else takes over and stuff like that, there's a real chance you just don't cash if you don't nail the rest of the race correctly, right? Like, dude, Bristol is just a fucking mess, man. It's just an absolute mess. And so, like, for me, when, I, when I'm just looking at salaries, and yet again, I'm, I don't really like doing salary reviews, but when I'm looking at salaries and stuff, and let's just go ahead and just look at me for this. When I'm looking at salaries and stuff, you know, as I said, we have Larson, Hamlin, Bell in the 11K range, Byron Blaney, Kyle Busch in the 10K range. Literally, pricing doesn't even matter. It literally, if you play him, you need him to lead laps. If he doesn't lead laps, lineup is most likely dead. Doesn't have a chance of being off mole. Has a real hard chance of even cashing. That's literally, like, pricing doesn't matter in that sense. It's literally... Even projections don't fucking matter. Yet again, if ever if the projections are just memes off of stuff, like if you're simming, and this is my criticism on, on things like this, if you're simming something, a site uh, publicly and privately on your own sims, depending on how many sims you do, and if you calculate it based on average, well, you you might have, if you sim this race a thousand times, you might have, you know, let's say like 23 percent of those races so 230 where larson leads and scores over 150 points you know and then in those other races you know you're calculating his his dnf percentage or races where he just doesn't lead and stuff it's so like yeah his mean and his averages like drops down you, you know you'd be in the 50s and then you look at somebody like chris rubel william byron and stuff oh well you know he's scoring over 50 he's scoring over 150 points in you know 150 of those races you know 15 percent of the races he's like the race winner. He's one of the guys leading laps. Then the other ones, he's scoring score like 34. Yet again, it brings the mean down to like 50 and stuff. And so like means that for me, that doesn't help me at all. Like, uh, so like be aware of that when you're, when you're building lineups and be aware of that when you're looking at salaries and stuff. Salaries don't matter. It's, is this guy going to lead laps? Yes. If he doesn't, that lineup is dead. Doesn't like that's, that's literally a basis on there. And so when I'm looking at salaries of guys that make a lot of sense, as like a tournament play, like this is one where I'd want to get different and get crazy and stuff. I think that's that's certainly worth it. Like Redick at nine thousand dollars, like I fucking love that. Truex eighty eight, Chastain eighty five. You know, Elliott, Gibbs, Wallace, eight eighty three, eight thousand seventy seven hundred, respectively on those guys. Like the nine K range has a really good chance of leading laps and being up there, um, especially if you're in a situation to where you know, you're playing just for example here. You got Grawl at five thousand dollars, Larson Byron at eleven five ten seven. Then you have Reddick at nine thousand dollars. You have sixty nine on average. Okay, like we can, we can realistically get back into the eight K range. We can realistically get back into at least you know two seven K guy drivers. Like, and it's it's just gonna be based on a lot of points. I mean, this video this video is probably horrible, but like. I don't know. The, the same arguments, in my opinion, of like, it's very difficult to project who's going to be scoring well at Daytona. It's the same thing in chasing the Optimal at Bristol. Uh, I have had just absolute horrendous luck and, and approaches at this racetrack. And so, yet again, for me, I'm going to base it on what I see in practice. That's, that's literally what it's going to be on. That is my prerogative. That is my focal point. I'm going to base it on what I see from the cars in practice. Uh, and I'm going to be very hesitant on playing expensive place differential that starts in the back because we have seen good cars be stuck in the back of the field, not be able to pass people. The leader runs them down, puts them a laps down, traps them a laps down. Like if you're, if you have an expensive guy trap the lap down, I'm, that lineup is done as well. Like it's not only does he not get the lead, your guy just runs six all day at, at $11,000. Oh my God! God forbid he goes a lap down. Ah, dude, he's freaking screwed. That's so well. That lineup is dead on arrival. Like, I 
I don't know, man. <laughs> Dude, it Bristol is like truly the most unfun DFS experience in NASCAR, in my opinion, for the Cup Series. Truck Series, easy to tell. Like, fast guys are going to be up front. Slow guys are in the back. That's how it is. The fact that the pack and being stuck in traffic and being difficult to pass, especially with this next-gen car here at Bristol, like... I'm gonna be. Pl- I'm gonna be. I'm just gonna be trying to nail the guys who are gonna lead laps, and that's gonna primarily be me playing guys starting up front and good pit stalls and punting at the very back of the starting grid with the cheapest guy I can find there. That is my absolute approach to Bristol this weekend. So yet again, I was very happy with starting from scratch, starting stuff over from Phoenix. I'm gonna do the same mentality here at Bristol because uh, Lord knows it can't get any worse than what I've been doing here already. So that is that is my approach for. For Bristol, and I know we're not really looking at a lot of stuff on the screen, or even looking at optimals and stuff, but that's just kind of where I stand. And uh, we can talk about it in more detail Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. I might go live Saturday night. Depends on if you guys want to do it. Uh, going over the practice stuff again, like we did last weekend, it performed very well, and I was very happy to see that many people uh, want to be there and, and look at that type of stuff. But that's really my opinion on the Cup Series at Bristol. I'll see you guys Sunday.